Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. That's exactly what we're doing. One of the people that helps us do that is Corey. Corey, what's up? Today we are going to be taking a look at the New Testament Gospel of John, the book itself and its authorship, as well as the empty tomb. Excellent, very good. What did you study today? Well, a very interesting phrase from John chapter 19 in which it says that Pilate was even more afraid. Very good. And also, Ryan, what did you study? Well, today we're talking about the famous dispute between the astronomer Galileo and the church. Does the Bible really claim that the Earth is at the center of the solar system? That's right. All of these things are coming your way, plus the teaching in which we're going to talk about the crucifixion. The Romans treated Jesus Christ like a criminal. We'll talk about that and more still to come right here on Quick Study. As we conclude our study of the New Testament Gospel, specifically here, we're in the last few chapters of the Gospel of John. You and I are going to be taking a look at the history of the Gospel of John itself, its authorship and when it was written. The Gospel of John is believed to have been the last written of the four New Testament Gospels. Internal and external evidence have led most scholars to agree that it was written sometime during the 80s or 90s AD, placing it during the reign of Emperor Domitian and making it one of the last New Testament books composed. Authorship of this gospel has traditionally been given to one of the Twelve Apostles. John, the brother of James, the sons of Zebedee. These brothers were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder by Jesus, and together with Peter, formed an inner circle of three disciples that Jesus sometimes taught alone. The Gospel itself claims to be written by the disciple whom Christ loved in John chapter 21. This disciple is never mentioned by name, perhaps a sign of modesty, but is referred to in the narrative several times. Interestingly, the disciple John is also never named in this gospel, but John the Baptist is and is simply referred to as John without the qualifying Baptist tagged onto his name. If the apostle John were the known party writing the gospel, then this would be explained. There would be no worry about the reader confusing the two Johns because one was writing and referred to himself as the beloved disciple. There has been some confusion over the testimony of the early church fathers. The earliest known witness is that of Papias, a student of the Apostle John who wrote in the second century. Papias seems to indicate two prominent Johns in the early church, so some believe that it was the second John and not the Apostle who wrote the Gospel. A close reading of Papias' lists reveals a probable solution. The list is broken into the disciples of Christ who had by the time passed away and the following generation of church leaders. Tradition tells of the long life of the Apostle John teaching into his old age at Ephesus. If correct, John could very easily have been listed on both lists, first as a disciple and second as an elder. I hope that you've been able to catch all of the quick study shows in which we've talked about the authorship of uh, the four different New Testament Gospels, uh, because each Gospel was written for a specific purpose. It had a, it had a specific theological goal in mind. And remember, the, the Gospel authors, uh, there's no historical evidence whatsoever that they felt free to invent history. In fact, there's, there's evidence to the contrary of that. There's evidence that even when the New Testament church, uh, the, the first century church ran into very difficult issues uh, and, and even fights. They did not invent sayings of Jesus or parables of Jesus or miracles of Jesus that would conveniently fix their problem. They just battled it out and prayed to God and asked for a resolution. And they used uh, um, expository teaching from the scriptures in order to figure out how to, how to handle and deal with those issues that they were 
were running into, but they never felt free to invent sayings of Jesus. So, so when we have, and when we look at these four gospels, we need to respect the fact that, that they're recording accurate history, but that they're also recording it uh, for their own theological purposes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each have similar, but different theological purposes. And a little bit later on the program, we're going to focus in on one of the purposes of the Gospel of John, the empty tomb. Today we study the details of the crucifixion. John 19 gives us insight to what was said and how Pilate responded to Jesus Christ and to the Jewish priest and the leaders. Pilate argued that Jesus Christ need not be killed as he found him innocent of any wrongdoing against the Roman Empire. But the Jewish leaders turned this into a fight for Caesar's position in Judah. The Roman soldiers mocked Jesus. Pilate had no choice but to release him to be crucified. And the argument was that it should have been the Romans who crucified Jesus because of the religious implications of their law. John 19, verses 1 through 16. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified, so they took Jesus and led him away. John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. We finish the Gospel of John. This is amazing. We look at the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is good. 
And as we look at it, we learn a lot of things. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first, I want to mention to you that at BibleDiscoveryTV.com, you can get your Bible guide. If you haven't received it yet, I encourage you to write for yours at the U.S. address, at the Canadian address, or at the British address, or you can go to www.BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click and give a donation there, and uh, donations help us tremendously, and it brings up uh, the PDF files of the, the guide. It's excellent. And so I want to encourage you to do that, and remember, we've got a TV station there 24-7. All the time, it's got something on for you, so keep that in mind. Now, in Steps of Faith, as we look at this, we are focused on the last part of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is interesting because it talks about something that we actually uh, have for the church today. In fact, the Gospel of John, the Gideons often give that out just for people who recently encountered Jesus Christ and got saved, as some people say, and as we say, saved from the, uh, the, the parliaments of hell. And it's very important that we are rescued for heaven when we understand this. But the details of the crucifixion is what we talk about in Statements of Faith. Our reading is John chapter 19 to 21. Continue to read that as we go through the Bible, as we look at this. And our, our specific scripture is John chapter 19, verses 1 to 16. Now, as we look at this, let's pay attention to what is happening. John chapter 19, verses 1 to 4. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Not a pleasant thought. Took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put on him a purple robe. And then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Isn't that interesting? So here we see something fascinating. The Romans treated Jesus Christ like a criminal. But Pilate found no fault in him and proclaimed that over and over again. Here we have in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ something very important. He is proclaimed a criminal and a criminal. He must be punished. Punished for what? Well, they consistently uh, barked out all kinds of things, but they're completely untrue. And beloved, as we understand this, we need to recognize that Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, fully God and fully man, Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins, not his own sins, for our sins. Very important that we need to recognize that so that we understand what Jesus Christ did for us. Now we go on and we learn a few things in verses 5 to 12. It says, then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Behold the man. Therefore, whenever the chief priest and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him. You take him. For I find no fault in him. And the Jews answered him and said, We have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went in again to the praetorium and he said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that they have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And from then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a, whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar fascinating. Even Rome's officials could not free Jesus Christ. Could not. 
Jesus was innocent, but God had a plan to deal with the sin that so badly infected us. This is something that we need to pay attention to, beloved. And then we go on to the next passage, which says, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and down in the judgment seat in, place, in a place that is called the pavement. But the Hebrew, Galbatha it's called, now was the pre preparation day of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, he had said to the Jews, behold your king. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered and said, we have no king but Caesar. And then he delivered him to them being crucified. And so they took Jesus away and they led him away. Now this brings me to the last point, beloved. Jesus Christ was led away to be crucified and he paid for all our sin. Jesus was more powerful than anyone could imagine at the exact moment of his crucifixion. And this is something that we need to consider, something we need to think about when we talk about Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. So when we think of that today, we need to remember that Jesus Christ not only died for our sin, but he willingly understood. They said, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus Christ stood there and willingly, willingly understood all of that uh, crucifixion talk, all of that talk, and was put on the cross, beloved, for you, put on the cross for me. Jesus Christ did this for us. And that's what we remember. You and I are going to focus in on the central event of every gospel, not the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, not the birth of Christ, not even the ministry of Jesus Christ, but the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As an event that would shake the entire world, influencing the tide of history so continuously, no incident can stand against the resurrection of Jesus Christ. According to the Gospel of Matthew, people began right away trying to explain the miraculous. The Pharisees paid Roman guards to say Jesus' body had been stolen from his sealed tomb, without the guards seeing or following. Though this bribed invention didn't do much to stop the spread of Christianity, archaeology has revealed that it likely influenced the ear of the Emperor of Rome known since 1878 an intriguing artifact named the Nazareth inscription may shed light on the official Roman response to Jesus's resurrection. As its name suggests, it came from the city of Nazareth and is strongly believed to be an authentic inscription from the first century. The inscription opens as an abridged version of an official decree from Rome. It's concerned with the stealing of entombed bodies. What makes this unusual is that this isn't grave robbing. No valuables are being taken, only bodies. It also appears that this decree is aimed specifically at Jewish and Christian Jewish lifestyle who commonly use the family tomb. The inscription also links the offense of stealing a body with an evil plan, a deviously thought out calculated offense. And the punishment is very severe, brought before a religious tribunal, and if found guilty, capital punishment. This inscription, dated to before AD 70, fits the time frame, the content, and even the culture that was reeling in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection. It was a dangerous belief, replacing the King of Rome with the King of Heaven in a time period of revolt. It appears that Rome's response was to place a decree in the very spot this leader was said to have come from, a place that even identified these Christians called Nazarenes. The stone was placed in Nazareth. In our modern world, skepticism has risen to an all-time high. God has been cast aside and the Bible has been accused of being full of lies. This all started when the father of lies first questioned God's word in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? 
It is, then, no surprise that after thousands of years of Satan spewing lies, doubt about God's word is at a record high. Unfortunately, the church is not void of this attack either. In fact, many, especially the youth, are becoming increasingly skeptical and abandoning the church and their faith altogether. This due largely to the lie that the scriptures contain errors and contradictions. How can we, as believers, combat this deception? Join Ryan Hembry in this month's special DVD offer as he both seeks the Word of God for strategy against the evil plot and dismantles the deception that the Holy Scriptures contain errors and contradictions. To order your copy of Crisis of Faith, Why Young People Are Leaving the Church, simply contact us and we would be happy to send it to you for a gift of $25 or more. Order your copy today. Thanks for staying with us as we continue to go through the Bible. Next time on Quick Study Television, I'm going to be talking about this. The church was growing strong in Jerusalem and then was persecuted. What's that about? We'll talk about it next time on Quick Study. Here's Ryan. Ryan? Today we're talking about the famous dispute between the astronomer Galileo and the Roman Catholic Church. Now at that time, the church believed in an Earth-centered solar system, but Galileo knew better. From this, Bible bashers now love to accuse the Bible of promoting an Earth-centered solar system. But what actually happened with Galileo and the church? And what does the Bible say about this? The idea of an Earth-centered solar system was the subject of the famous dispute between the astronomer Galileo Galilei and the Roman Catholic Church. Indeed, while the Church of the time believed in a geocentric, that is an Earth-centered solar system, Galileo promoted the heliocentric, or sun-centered solar system. Today, we know that Galileo was in fact correct. From this, many attacks have been made against the Bible, claiming that it too promotes geocentrism. Critics cite Psalm 19, 4-6, which states, Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Does this passage actually support an earth-centered solar system? Two facts must first be established. First, the Roman Catholic Church of Galileo's time was for some reason foolishly accepting the teachings of the Greeks, which included geocentrism. So this was not something they took directly from the scriptures. Second, Galileo was himself a man of God and a believer of the Bible and did not accept this teaching. Therefore, these facts considered, there are at least two possibilities in regards to the Psalm 19 passage. First, we must understand that the Bible is a book from God to mankind and man is very earth-centric. Indeed, both laymen and scientists alike refer to the sun setting or rising, or say that the stars come out at night. These expressions, however, do not claim that the sun is in motion around the earth, or that the stars are not always there. In the same way, the Bible also sometimes speaks with these expressions, especially in a poetical passage such as this. But in no way is it promoting geocentrism. Second, to the astonishment of many, it has recently been discovered that the Sun is actually in orbit. While not in orbit around its planets, it is in orbit around our galaxy at an incredible velocity of 250 kilometers per second. Yet it goes even beyond this, because while we are in orbit around the Sun, and the Sun is in orbit around the galaxy, the galaxy is also in motion through the universe. This passage in Psalms, then, could be referring to this very thing. So we discovered the truth. The church at that time had accepted the false teaching of geocentrism, not from the Bible, but from the Greeks. From this, we learn an important lesson. Never let the pop science of the day come in authority over the scriptures. Remember, the Bible has proven itself time and time again to be right. Scientists, on the other hand, have been wrong countless times. Science textbooks change all the time, but the Bible never changes. Thank you, Ryan. Excellent mm -hmm. job. Very good. Really good. Uh, what did you study today? Well, we're looking in, we're, we're actually in the book of John, chapter 19, 
And we find this really interesting statement, at least I do anyway, where um, if we start back, uh, Pilate has brought Jesus out. He's saying, behold the man, the, the chief priests and, and the Jews are yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate is saying to them, you take him and crucify him, which is a, a really a, sar a sarcastic statement because he knows that in their law they can't. For I find no fault in him, Pilate says. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Then there's this interesting verse that says, therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Well, what made him afraid in the first place that now them saying that has made him more afraid? Well, if we go back to the account that Matthew tells in Matthew chapter 27, verse 19, earlier that morning, Pilate's wife has a dream about Jesus. And it says, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, that means Pilate, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. So this just compound, it was like a bad nightmare coming true for Pilate who found no fault in Jesus Christ. How interesting is that? It really is, it really is. The great mystery of Jesus Christ is how God confronted and defeated sin's power over our lives. The choice has been taken from Satan and given to us. Mankind can choose between forgiveness of sin or not. Someone had to pay the high cost of sin, and Jesus Christ did that with his crucifixion. Today, there are many who cannot understand that. Everything in life has been made part of the plan and keeps us in bondage. But we must remember that death is not a part of natural life. According to the Bible, death is the cost of sin. We were never meant to die, and now we can choose to live. You know, it's important to understand who God is. When we come to this place, we realize that God is real. And there's something about this program and something about many other programs that God has made clear to us. He's used our modern media to come to us and say, I'm alive and I'm real. Jesus Christ came and died for your sin and mine many years ago and he rose again. And if you invite him as Lord into your life, he will save you.